But the question is, with shops about to reopen, has John Lewis gone too early? Kate Hardcastle first on this, retail analyst known as the customer whisperer. This follows uh, announcements of, of previous closures, doesn't it, Kate, from, from John Lewis. What do you think about this batch? Have they gone too early? I think it's a very... Um the strategy that Dame Sharon White has put in place for John Lewis is it could be described as quite radical. Last year, she announced movements towards uh, them being almost landlords for residential properties, um, increasing the financial services offer, really playing on that very trusted brand that they know they have. And certainly within that, they were completely clear that retail for them would be very much more about the online space and looking realistically at the store network. So what we know from last year when retail reopened, Phil, is that the footfall did return, but it was a nervous footfall. It wasn't to the full normal amount we would have expected at the times of year we were seeing it. And areas that really did better than others were things like open air shopping parks where people could drive the vehicle in. And when I was speaking to consumers there, they said they felt very comfortable there. They could pop in for something, pop back out. So that what we call the dwell time, spending mm. time shopping around, perusing, just wasn't happening to any extent. And that's people being responsible in the main. They didn't want to spend any longer than they needed to. Lots of click and collect services as well. So I think speaking to people today who work for the organisation, people who supply it, obviously whenever a big name goes out and talks about closures, job losses, it's a hurt. But this is an organisation that is saying, if we don't make these changes now, we're not going to survive in the future. We have to be radical. And I think they will have done all the analysis to understand the costs of these stores and what the opportunity would have been if they reopened and got an amount of people back within them. So it's interesting to hear you say that because I've spoken to a few people about this today because, when, it, as you say, when it's a, a kind of blue chip brand like John Lewis, the, mm. the reaction is, is one of shock. But actually, when you speak to people about shopping online with John Lewis, the complaints are that the website isn't intuitive enough. It's not as, as straightforward as Amazon where you go, choose it, stick it in your basket, check out, gone. The other complaint is that they charge for click and collect where other stores mm. don't. So is that mm. going to hamper them if they decide to pursue this online? Are they going to have to look at that? They're going to have to really look into, and when we talk about selling online, it's the whole relationship build online. So everything from how you present your products, how you engage with your consumers, how do you build relationships in that space? I think there has been this naivety, like we'd be polite to some of the boardrooms in our retail landscape of what is an online store. It isn't a catalogue reproduced <laughs> online that you just put through a basic transactional basis for consumers. It's got to be so much more than that because our intuitive uh, retailers that have come in, particularly from the States and other places, are doing it so much better. And I'll tell you who else is doing it really well. Smaller businesses. Smaller businesses that have pivoted to online sales in the lockdown are really intuitive using brand, you know, social media like Instagram to really grow their brand and have a conversation. Now, John Lewis can't do it on a micro level, but they're going to have to get much more emotionally intelligent online. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, Kate, um, stay with us a second while we uh, bring our second guest into the discussion, who's Beverly Sunderland. Beverly's the Managing Director of Crossland Employment Solicitors. And Beverly, the reason we wanted your perspective is that the way John Lewis employs people is, is slightly different, isn't it? Is it, is it? Do we still call it a cooperative these days? Yes, yeah. yeah, evening, Phil. I, I don't think you do. Uh, I think employee ownership trust, I think, is the is the technical term for it. Uh, in fact, uh, my firm is one as well. So uh, we, we 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 speak the same language, shall we say? OK, so just explain what that is for the uninitiated and then we can explain the impact on the people who work for John Lewis. Yes, of course. Well, um, what it means is that everybody who is employed by John Lewis um, actually owns it. So they, they don't get an actual share certificate to say, here is your 1.3 shares. But what it means is, is that when there are profits um, available, then the employees get to benefit from them. And employee ownership trusts, you can give your employees a, a tax-free uh, bonus of up to £3,600 a year. Um, and also they can share in how well it, it, it's doing. So it's a great model and they really were the leaders in it. So how does that, these jobs that are at risk, I mean, we don't know, do we, at the moment, whether John Lewis will be able to absorb those back into the organisation or if those jobs will go. But what does that happen to the, what does that mean to the ownership status? Well, you, you are an owner for as long as you are an employee. Mm. And so 
they will still need to be treated in the same way as any other employee, and that is consulted with uh, about proposed redundancies, um, whether electing representatives, um, or whether it is their recognised union. Um, but but I, I think that there is an added layer here in that there will be trustees of the ownership trust who have to make sure that John Lewis is doing the right thing for John Lewis and for the business overall. Now, I have to say, they wouldn't have got to this stage announcing it to the press if they hadn't already been through that. And and I'm quite sure that given the model that they've got, it really is the worst case scenario if they have to lose some of their their partners. I mean, it is John Lewis and partners if they have to lose some of them. So I I think that they will be probably going all out to make sure that they absorb them perhaps into um, uh, Waitrose or into other areas. Yeah, that's a good point about Waitrose. Um, uh, Kate, we didn't really touch on that, but now more and more Waitroses are offering John Lewis Collect services. I wonder if kind of parts of bigger Waitroses might become mini John Lewis's. Well, they're definitely talking about putting small shops and frontages of the John Lewis brand in Waitrose. And I think that's very similar to uh, the situation with mini Argos bars in Sainsbury's where you can just go to the bar and yeah, collect right. items. I think I think that makes obvious sense. I mean, Waitrose is really interesting. It's reported that the sales are up 8%. And we've seen that with all the supermarkets um, because obviously we've been, as, as shopping in essential stores, we've been reliant on those supermarkets a lot of the times. They too, have had to go through a real journey because you may remember they separated from Mercado just before all of all of this and went alone with their online uh, sales for supermarkets uh, products and, and that's been a journey for them as well so they've got a lot going on they're also the supermarket that people are still waiting to see what might happen uh, with the support that they were given because they've not handed back the 170 million uh, estimated in business rates relief so they've they've, they've completely uh, completed on a loan that they took but they haven't given back that business rates where we know other supermarkets have stepped forward so there's even interesting things afoot there now all supermarkets have said look the situation has cost us so much more we've had to increase and intensify in training safety practices we've had to try and run at the online delivery slots we've really had to evolve our businesses so we've had a lot of costs outweighing against the the additional sales we've made but it's really quite a changing challenging time for the organization yes i would imagine they will do all they can for the partners to try and find a new place for them maybe even in the online sort of the back office uh, places as well but that idea of if you think about a store like the sheffield store which one of them's going it's been such a pinnacle for the city center there and the knock-on effect and then these black spaces that that creates where we have that shadow that's there for a few years until that property's re-emerged and energized in something else it has a real knock-on effect to the businesses around it so there's gonna be a lot of pain with these store closures before we get uh you know positivity yeah and the birmingham one i mean that was a you know that was another flagship store that when they opened yes. that that saw you know that the um uh, the bullring development uh, didn't it as well uh beverly what do you think this says then about the, uh, the state of the high street well, I, I mean, I, I certainly don't have Kate's expertise here, but I've seen quite a lot of comment recently that is actually saying, listen here, chaps, we're, we're British. This is the opportunity for us to diversify, for us to take advantage. Um, to, uh, Kate was talking about a lot of the smaller businesses online who have really benefited. And you've got to think, well, no, what, why why can't we see that reflected in the high street um, with... with um, fun places to go, uh, places to eat, places to have coffee, more of those developing as we move more and more to online shopping. Um, so so I, I think that, that we should see this really as as an opportunity. And all of those little, little brands that have had the ability to grow during lockdown, um, perhaps just taking that next step, thinking, well, you know, perhaps we could be on the high street. Kate? Yeah, a very good summary. I think I'm going to have to brush up in terms of my uh, people employment <laughs> skills. Um, I think absolutely it's so important to understand that out of every pandemic that's been in the history books, and I've been back there over the last 12 months, it's been a catalyst for change. It is incredibly painful. We are talking about job cuts. Every job means a livelihood, a family are affected by it. I don't say this lightly, but we've needed an evolution on our high street for over a decade now. We've needed places that are human high streets that are not really 
client just on retail, places to be. We have an isolation crisis, Phil, and you know, you and I have talked about that. I'm worried yeah. we need places for people to have community again. So let's get the purpose right. Let brilliant retail be part of that. And let's hope we can rely on these entrepreneurs who've been able to pivot and have done such amazing things to drive the future. And let's hope that future is a better balance between bigger and smaller businesses. Because smaller businesses give us our identity of place and that's what we need to. Thank you very much for your perspectives, Kate Hardcastle, retail analyst known as the Customer Whisperer. And uh, we heard also from Beverly Sunderland, Managing Director of Crossland Employment Solicitors.